Good morning, everyone, and happy Friday. Best day of the week. Hope that you guys had a great week. Hope that you are uh, having a great day so far. We're just, uh, I believe this is Masterclass number two for Masterclass Friday. Uh, Paul Tranny just left the stage and he was showing some cool 3D stuff. So if you're new to this, this is Masterclass Friday here on Adobe Live where the Adobe Evangelists get to do their favorite things for an hour um, each Friday. So with that said, we're going to pick up where we left off last week, which was part one of Photoshop 101 Crash Course. This is part two. Um, if you didn't watch part one and you want to start from the beginning, you can always go back and watch that replay. And if you're um, like you can't hang out for this one or you want to see more stuff, you want to see stuff that you missed, you can always watch this replay as well when it's done. So with that said, um, I see Robin's, uh, Robin's over on YouTube and Tim and Jay over on YouTube. I see a bunch of people here in the main chat. Um, Bruce Gonzalez, Anika, Oliver, Tanya, Craig, Victoria. And if you are um, hanging out on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Twitch, LinkedIn, you can certainly hang out there. But uh, you're probably going to be better off if you want to participate in the main chat by heading over to b.net slash adobe live because i don't always see the questions um, in real time for the other chats so that way i won't miss your question if it's something really important uh, like thomas just said good morning here in atlanta and i'm in atlanta too so good morning but if uh, thomas just wants to say good morning and nothing else he can certainly hang out over there on youtube but if you want to see and hang out with the other kids over in the main chat, head over to b.net slash Adobe Live, log in with your Adobe ID, which is free to create if you don't already have one. And um, then, like I said, you can uh, be in the main chat. Either way, let's continue where we left off. This is for, and I'll kind of just give this one quick primer. This is for Photoshop beginners. This is for people that are just now starting out with Photoshop. And like I said last week, if you already know Photoshop and you're, you're going to say, well, I would do it this way, this class isn't, that's not what this is. <laughs> this class isn't for you because obviously you already know how to use Photoshop. Obviously, you already have your technique. And uh, as I said last week, there are 50 ways just to do about everything in Photoshop. And I'm not going to cover all 50. So I may not cover the way you would do it if you already know how to do it. So I'm get, I get to cover one, maybe two ways each for each thing, and that's about it. And of course, you can hone your own skills over time and develop your own techniques. So with that said, <clears throat> enough of that. Let's go ahead and pop over to Photoshop. And literally, we're going to pick up right where I got cut off last week on Adobe Live, but I did finish it on all the other channels. Uh, but we're going to pick up where I got cut off. So let's go do that. <clears throat> we left off on this image. And um, there were a couple issues with this image. Number one, the, the cutout, the masking wasn't that great, especially around the fingers, because I just did a quick uh, select subject and it didn't do a good job around his fingers. So if I were to move the word beach, which is on its own layer, if I were to move that up, you can see the white here between the fingers. So that's, <laughs> that's just a bad cutout. And, um, and by the way, there's going to be a dead giveaway that obviously the word beach isn't floating in midair, but it's a dead giveaway of just bad Photoshop. And I was thinking about that before the class started today. And I was thinking, what, what defines good Photoshop? Because at the end of the day, <clears throat> people aren't sitting over your shoulder watching what you did. For the most part, they're watching the finished results. So whether you took two seconds or whether you took two hours is irrelevant for the people looking at the image, because they don't know one way or the other how long it took. But if it's good Photoshop, then whatever you did, A, looks good, and B, more important, looks more believable. This doesn't look believable because you'd see the white outline around the sleeves. You see all the stuff that makes it look like, oh, you not only did a cutout job, you did a bad cutout job. So a lot of what you're going to learn going forward today, in the future, all the things we do here in the master classes is how to be better at Photoshop, how to have more realistic um, um, uh, results. 
And, and I was thinking about this yesterday in the car, just think about compositing in general, because that's what this is, it's a composite. It's compositing the text underneath this, underneath this guy's uh, hands. Um, there are really three areas of compositing that matter. And I'm not gonna go down a whole compositing path because that's not the purpose of today. But just to keep these things in the back of your mind as you're, as you're going down your Photoshop journey. When you're gonna put two or more pictures together and you want it to be believable, the three to four things you have to keep in mind is, is the perspective right? Meaning is the person or thing at the right angle and the right perspective and does it look like it would really be there? Number two, and this is uh, Sergio, if you were ever watching this, Sergio shared this post with me on Facebook and it was kind of like a, a the police posted this post warning people not to go down a particular road because it was closed. But they put an officer on the road with his hand pointing at the sign <laughs> and, and, and he tagged me in it and he said, you guys should get Terry, Terry to do your Photoshop. And I was like, well, what's he talking about? And at first glance, I didn't really notice too many things bad. The lighting looked a little off, but the, and the perspective was fine. But number two, shadows. There were no shadows from the guy at all, not even under his feet. Like one of his feet were like if lifted up a little bit, no shadows whatsoever. So literally somebody cut them out, stuck them on the road and didn't finish. They didn't put the shadows in to make it look more realistic. And number three, which is the one I did notice right off the bat, the lighting looked different and not bad, just different. Like the, the light on his forehead didn't look like the lighting in the, in the background of the road. So I'm like, ah, yeah, well, that was, that was my first giveaway. Then when I noticed the shadows, I'm like, oh yeah, bad Photoshop. So again, at the end of the day, perspective, lighting, and um, shadows are gonna be the dead giveaways. And this is an obvious one, just bad cutouts. Now, we usually don't see too many of these because people tend to get this part right. But um, those three to four things are you should always have in the back of your mind when you're trying to put two or more four, two or more photos together. Does it look real? And usually, if one of those first three things are off, chances are it doesn't, and you're not going to fool anybody. Okay, because we we our eyes have become trained to look for the signs of a bad bad Photoshop. Now I cheated last week. I said, because I, I was running out of time. I was literally doing this at the last minute and I got cut off. I said, oh no, his his uh his fingers, I didn't I didn't look at that to see if they were cut out right. And so I just moved it down <laughs> so that his fingers against the sky looked the way they always look because he was against the sky. Now, and of course you're if you if you still look at the sleeve, it's still white over here. But that was the biggest dead giveaway was the um the uh, the the white between the fingers, the clouds between the fingers. Now this could be a highlight, you know, like there's a highlight here on the side, but those are the kinds of things that you gotta ask yourself going forward. Um, does it look real? And show it to somebody before you post it. Like show it to your friends, show it to someone in your house, show it to someone in your office. Hey, does this look real? Or don't even say, does it look real? Just show it to them. Hey, what do you think of this? and let them look at it for a minute. And if they don't see anything right off the bat, just make them look at it a little bit longer and then say, hey, anything look off on this? And they'll usually see what it is. They may not know what it is. They may not know that the lighting's off, but they'll say something's off. Okay, not gonna spend any more time on that, but I will show you how one of the ways you could correct this as a Photoshop beginner. All right, so we have the three layers. We're gonna do more on layers today. So we have the guy layer on top, the beach layer um, below that in the background, the original background. So this is what we started with last week. I um, duplic I made us, I did a um, select subject of the guy. So I did this, uh, select subject, and it figured out that he was the subject, but I didn't zoom in to see if it was doing a good job around him. And that's what I should have done. So had I zoomed in, I would see, see that the, the, the marching ants, as we call these this little animation, is not going between the fingers. So I could see right off the bat, if I'd have zoomed in, that that's off. All right, but anyway, when I, when I, uh, when I selected them, and, and this foot's not being selected, there were other things that I was concentrating on, but not the fingers. Then I duplicated that layer, which gave me this, 
by itself. And you can see here where I missed part of his ankle. That's fine because I'm not going to be down there anyway. And um, then I added the text and I just moved it, I added the text on top, which looked like this at first. And then I just drug it down to be in between. Okay, so that's how we ended up where we are. Now, how would you, after the fact, fix this? I could start over, do a better selection, and fix the fingers, and then duplicate the layer and fix the ankle, so forth and so on. But um, the ankle doesn't matter because I'm not putting anything down there, so it's still the same ankle from the background. But if I wanted to fix this, I, I have a couple of ways to do it. I can erase that white to re just simply remove it, or, or I can mask it to temporarily hide it in case I make a mistake erasing. So we're gonna learn about masking today too. But let's say, how would I get rid of this? One of the ways you could do it is to select it. So we're on the guy layer. They have to be on the right layer for what you wanna select. And uh, one of the tools I chose uh, which is a tool I rarely use <laughs> because it's one of the original tools and there are better tools now, but the magic wand is kind of good for this. This is what it's for. So we're going to spend some more time on selecting today too. So if I were to take the magic wand tool and if you hover over it, it I think it gives you a little description of what it does. It allows you to select based on color range, based on the color of what you click on. So since his arm is brown, his shirt is kind of gray or whatever color that is, I'm okay clicking on the white between his fingers because it's, there's no white on him on the subject. So if I click that white, any of the white that's connected gets selected as well. So all of this got selected. Now, there are some areas here that didn't get selected because it see how it's broken, the connection's broken right here? So it didn't continue. But if I hold down my shift key, shift is always the way you will add to a selection. Your option or alt key is always the way you will um, subtract from a selection. So if I hold down the shift key and click, see how it added that? If I come over here and click, shift key still down, it added that, so forth and so on. So I could painstakingly do this, but if I had a whole bunch of this to do, I would just better, I would be better off going back and starting over with a better selection. I, I didn't do anything to make the selection better. I just said select subject, duplicate layer, and then these were the consequences. Had I started with a better select subject and gone into select and mask, I could have eliminated a lot of this without having to do what I'm doing now. So a lot of techniques in Photoshop, 50 ways to do something. This is one way. It's probably not the best way, but it depends on your comfort level. So our, if, if, this, if his arm was the only thing I had to fix, maybe this is faster. But if I got to fix all the way around him, just go redo the selection. Because it's gonna take me more time to do this than it's gonna to take to just do it right in the first place. Okay, so now that I've got this, let's say this is all I needed to do. Then to remove those pixels, and since I'm on a separate layer, I can remove them, just hit delete, and they're gone. Now, that's not necessarily the best tool, best selection, still left a little bit of area over here, I'd have to do it again. And this is what I mean by time consuming. So, um, yes, that fixed the problem if this was all I had to fix, but it's not. Once I start looking around him, there all, there's all kinds of white area around him that I would just be better off doing it over again. So, but if that were all, so again, you got to judge the job based on how long is it going to take me to try and fix it all versus how long would it take me to do it over and do it right. So, those are the kind of decisions you're going to be making from now on. Okay. So that is how, that's one way to handle that. Right, we're going to do some, we're going to do some selections right now and do them the right way. So I also left off with, let's say this was your finish. Let's say you were done. Let's say you fixed all the white. You did it over again, whatever you did, and you got it right. How would you now save this? How would you now share this? So we ended the class on my other channels with the saving part, but I got cut off of Adobe Live before I could show that part. And I didn't show the fixing last week either. So uh, how would I now save this? So, yep, time is money. And Nicholas, absolutely. Uh, could you select the mask on the layer and use... Oh, yeah, sure. There was no mask, though, in this case. Remember, I didn't make a mask. I just said duplicate layer. So if I had done selecting mask and there was a mask, then yes, I could go back and refine it. All right. Um, but in this case, there isn't one. 
So um, I'd have to make one. Anyway, <laughs> let's just do it right in the first place. Let's not spend a whole lot of time on all the ways we could fix it. All right, so let's, uh, let, let's say that I want to save this now. There's two ways you're going to save something. In Photoshop, you're going to save something that you may want to return to and continue working. I didn't leave my computer on all week from last Friday. I saved this and closed it and quit Photoshop and did work all week. And now I reopened it this week right in front, you know, right before the, the class. So how do I save something in Photoshop with all the layers intact and everything so I can always get back to it to continue working? Well, when you do a save, um, when you do a save or save as, the format you want to make sure you're in is Photoshop. Now, TIFF will work as well, but I can't, I can't give you a single reason why you would use TIFF over Photoshop. So Photoshop is your safest bet. That's always going to con contain everything that you did in Photoshop. All the layers, the text will still be editable. The, um, all the adjustments we're gonna talk about, all the, everything that you can do will be saved in the Photoshop format. So the extension for that is .psd, Photoshop document. Um, so as long as I save it somewhere that I can always get back to, so I saved it in my crash course folder and there it is, it's already saved with the PSD on the end, um, then I can always get back to it and open it and everything's still there. So that's how I was able to get back to the same layer, so forth and so on. However, if you're saving it to use, to give to a client, to post on social media, to use in something as your profile pick on a social media site, if you're saving it to use it on something, to print it on, or give it to a printer, then you're not gonna give them a PSD. You're not going to give them a Photoshop file. The Photoshop file is for you. Everything else is for everybody else. So the most common format for images, and again, we could spend an hour just on formats. The most common format for images is going to be JPEG. That's the format that is universally accepted for everything you're going to post. If you're sharing it, if you're printing it, if you're putting it on social media, if you put it in your portfolio site, JPEG is always going to work. Okay. Um, can you save the file in a Photoshop library? Absolutely. So let's go in and uh, instead of save or save as, the way you would save it to give it to someone or post it somewhere is export. And you're gonna do export as. This is going to let you make another copy that's not the Photoshop file that you can use and give and post and do whatever you wanna do with, email, whatever it is. So if I say export as, a uh, couple things. You want to, A, make sure the format is a format you want to use. So JPEG, PNG, uh, GIF, or GIF, GIF, whatever battle you want to fight that one with. All right, JPEG. Quality. Um, do you want full quality or do you want uh, less quality? Full quality is going to make a bigger file, going to be full quality. Less quality is going to make a smaller file, won't be full quality. So quality is quality. Depends on what you're going to do with it. Do you need it to be this big? That's the other thing. Do you need it to be 5,487 pixels wide? I don't know. Depends on what you're doing with it. If you're going to print it, yeah, you want full resolution. If you're going to post it on social media, probably not. You don't need it to be this big. And if you're trying to post it on as a profile pic, you're probably going to run into, it needs to be only, you know, 400 by 400. Can't be any bigger than that. Whatever. You're going to run into size limitations. So if you get a size limitation warning, this is where you go change that so you don't get that warning anymore. So for example, if I were to say for Instagram, it only needs to be 1080 on the longest edge, then that drops it down to almost 20% and uh, makes it 1080 by 721. And again, this is just a copy. I'm not changing my original. And over here, you can also see the file size that it anticipates it's gonna be. So if you get a file size limit, oh, it can only be 800K or whatever, then you'll know right off the bat when you size it down. So when I say export, that's going to export another copy and we'll, we'll call this one uh, for social. And we'll put that in the same folder we were in. There it is in the crash course folder. And we can also put the JPEG on it, but it, it should do it for me and then save. So now I got my PSD with all my layers to always be able to come back to and I got the JPEG 
to give to anybody else or post on social. Okay, that's the exporting and saving that we ended with last week that I didn't really go into enough detail on, but now you got it. Let's move on. Let's close this one because we are done with it. I hit save again. That's just going to save the JPEG. I'm sorry. Ah, forget that. It's going to save the PSD with the layers. So there it is, the PSD. If I were to ever to go back to it, there it is. Their layers are all there. Um, the JPEG does not have those layers. All right, so it's flattened. Basically, the JPEG flattens it. No layers, no editable text, one layer background, just the, the image, the way it looks. So now if I were to go open, by the way, and here's the one we did for social, and that's what it looks like, but it would have, if we were to open that, just to show you proof of concept, it's just the background. There's no, I can't move it around. I can't change the text. I can't do anything. It's just the background. Okay, that's not what we want to open though. Let's open up um, something else. We're going to open up. I want to open up a uh, living room. Great. And I want to open up this boss. Not that one, the other one. I want to open up this one. Yep, there we go. Okay, you might already see where I'm going with this. You get a job where they say, hey, or not even a job, just something you want to do. Hey, I want to put this vase over here in this room. How do I do that? 50 ways. Let me show you one of those ways. So one of those ways to do that, let me just give you a primer on copying an image from one copying the pixels from one image to another. So I want to get this vase over there. I could select the vase first, copy just the vase. I could take the whole image over and remove the background. I can, do it, you know, it just depends on, again, 50 ways, whichever way you think is best. So um, let me show you the dragging way that most people fail at because when they're starting out because they don't know. If I want to drag this over to the other window, you can't see the other window. But you, you don't have to, you can, you, you can view and arrange and show them, you know, uh, make them float and all that. You don't have to do any of that. All you have to do is start dragging it and then drag up to the tab. And that will automatically switch you over to the other window. But don't let go. Because when you let go, nothing happens. I just let go. Nothing happens. You weren't finished yet. Go, but now I got to start over. Drag it up to the tab. Don't let go. Drag it down into the window then you can let go. <laughs> if you just drag it to the tab, you weren't finished. So you're now dragging it down and now it's there. So now it created its own layer. If you look in the layers panel, there's layer number one on the background, on top of the background, and we can double click on layer number one and uh, name the layer. And now if I'm on the move tool, a layer can be moved around. So I can put the vase wherever I want. Hey, I want it right there. But it's a, kind of a super huge vase. So that's one problem. Number two, it's got the old background. That's the second problem. So let's fix first problem first. We can scale it down. Or you could, you could, you know what? Let me let me do it the, the beginner way. Before I even worry about the size, I got to get rid of the background because I can't see what size I need to be until the background's gone. So how do I do that? Well, luckily for you, um, you have a way to try this in your properties panel. The properties panel is right there in the Essentials workspace. There's a remove background right there. There's a button for it. The remove background button is right there on the properties panel. It's only there on a layer. It's not there on the background. Talk about that later. So if I just simply click remove background, that's letting Photoshop do two things. Select subject, which we already saw on the guy and add a mask covering the background so it's non-destructive. Remember we talked about non-destructive last week? So remove background, that's it. And someone asked, I think it was uh, Dave asked earlier about the masking, because I did it this way, you now have a new thing on your layer called a mask. This, whenever you see this icon, that means that's actually goodness. That means the rest of the image is still there but it's hidden under all the black area. So the white is only what's showing through. So the rest of the background is still here. I can get it back. And we're going to talk about how masking works in a minute. But now that I remove the background, I can see what I'm doing. So, and by the way, one other gotcha. 
one of these are selected at a time. So if I want to size the base down, I need to be on this, not this. This is dealing with the mask. This is dealing with the actual vase. So make sure you're on the right one. So now that I'm on the right one, I can go up to my image menu. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I can go up to my edit menu. Yeah, because I always do it from the keyboard shortcut. I sometimes forget where it is. Uh, Command T, keyboard shortcut, Control T on Windows is free transform. Free transform. See how it put the box all the way around it because it knows the background is still there. You're not just sizing the vase, you're sizing the hidden area too. So if I grab any corner and scale down and I can grab another corner and scale in, I am now making that vase the right size. All right. Remember when I talked about that picture my friend sent me of the officer? What was wrong with the officer? No shadow. This still looks very much like it's floating because it doesn't have anything that makes it look like it's on the ground. When you look at everything else in this picture, there's a shadow being cast because there's a window there. So you have to look at all of the areas of the photo and say, hey, there's a window over there casting light. The shadows are going that way. This vase, it, like if you, if you showed this to a kid and said, hey, what's, what's it? find the one thing that's different. This vase doesn't have a shadow. So that's going to naturally be a giveaway of what's wrong. Floating vase, that's right. So um, now I got to think about how would I make this look real? So A, needs a shadow. B, uh, needs maybe two shadows. It needs one underneath it, like just a darker area around the bottom of it. And it needs one that lays down that goes out and is very faint that you can't, because if you look at all the other shadows, you can barely see them, uh, except for when it gets over behind the chair in the dark area. But there, this is close enough to the, now if I were to move this back here, then, I, oh, that's cutting it off. Then I may only need the one on, underneath it. So again, that's cheating. Now say, oh, let's make it easy. Let's just put the one underneath it. But if I want to put it here, then I got to do more work. I got to put it down and put one underneath it and put one that lays down in the direction that everything else is going. So how would I create that shadow? <sighs> let me show, let me just show you uh, the one underneath because that's an easy one. Because the other one laying down, well, there's a few more steps that I'm not sure I'm ready to teach beginners yet. Uh, but anyway, let's, uh, let's, let's put the one underneath. Now, I don't want to mess up the background and the base is on its own layer. So what I want is a layer in between that I can mess with for the shadow. So I'm just going to come down here to the plus sign at the bottom of the layers panel and where it says create a new layer. That's what it says cut off right now. But anyway, create a new layer. But the layers, on, it always puts it on top. I want to put it underneath. So I drag it down and I name it so I know what it's for. Shadow or base shadow even better because you might have more than one shadow. All right, base shadow. Um, so now, now that I got this empty layer, we're gonna learn what layers are really for. An empty layer is just that clear piece of acetate over the background underneath the vase. Do whatever you want on it, because it's not gonna affect the background, it's not gonna affect the vase. Do whatever you want. And since it's underneath the vase, it is underneath the vase. So if I were to grab, just for just for giggles, if I were to grab a paintbrush, black, so I, I grab the brush tool, which you can just hit the letter B if you couldn't find it, showing you what it does. What color will it do it in is based on these colors here. The foreground color is what the whatever whatever tool you're painting with uses. So in this case, the foreground color is already the color I want it to be, black. But if it wasn't, uh, let's say I change, let's say it was purple. So now it's purple. Let's say that I want it to quickly get that back to black. There's a keyboard shortcut that resets this default color. Default color. It's the letter D for default color. Just hitting the letter D on your keyboard, no matter what colors are there, will all automatically switch them to black and white. If you want to toggle the foreground and background, the background color is what's on. Remember how I erased the, the fingers? If I had a, remember uh, last week when I showed you the eraser tool and it erased in white, that's what, that's because it was using a background color. So whatever you're 
taking away will be in that color. Whatever you're adding will be in the foreground color. So you can toggle the foreground and background with the letter X or the little toggle button right here. Uh, yeah, you can see that right here above it. So this is the letter X on your keyboard, switches them, and letter D puts them back to the defaults. And the foreground is always the top one. So now if I just come under this, here, let's zoom in so we can see what we're doing. Floating base, bad shadow. So there's a couple reasons that shadow's bad. <laughs> Number one, it's a hard edge. Your sh no shadow here, they're all soft. So undo, that was just bad. Number two, it was it was a little overkill. I like went crazy with it. So number one, we're on the brush tool. We can set the hardness of the brush or softness just by clicking this little icon on the control panel. We talked about the control panel last week. So the control panel um, is the, the size of the brush and the hardness or softness. So right now it's on 100% hard, a hard edge brush. We don't want that. <laughs> Nailed it. So we want to pull that softness, all our hardness, all the way down to a soft brush. So now if I were to do the same thing and don't go as crazy, then it looks like that. So that starts to look a little bit better. It looks at least it's at least it's more believable that there's something under it. It's too dark, but at least there's something there. Now, um, how do we handle the too dark part? Because if you look at the rest of the, the things, the chair right under it might have a, the legs of the chair might be a little dark like that, but that's a little too dark for how close it is to the window. So how do we do that? Well, the layer itself, because remember the layer, we just painted on that layer. We can move it, by the way, if we grab the move tool, we can actually move that shadow around. Um, but more importantly, right about there maybe. More importantly, each layer has its own opacity. So the opacity right now is we're looking at 100% of that black. If we were to just simply lower the opacity of the layer, we're making that black transparent. So we can maybe do something like that. Now it still looks like it's floating. That's a perspective issue because the vase is straight up and down the floor is leaning forward a little bit. So that's, remember I said perspective, lighting, and shadows? So we, we're, we're trying to solve shadows, but the perspective of the vase is still off. Um, but anyway, we added the shadow, we toned it down a little bit. It looks a little bit more believable, but because the front ed edge of that vase is sticking up, it's never gonna be totally believable unless we bring that down. Okay, next up. Uh, so let's, let's work on a perspective a little bit. Again, 50 ways to do this. One way you could do it is, um, again, uh, uh, of the 50 ways, I'm trying to think of the beginner way. One of the ways you can do this is you could warp it. You could also go into perspective. You could go into free, like there's, there's 50 ways. Let me think, which way do I want to show you? Uh, let's go into free transform. And let's go into, so I hit Command T, and let's go into, um, let's go to warp. Okay, warp. This is uh, just showing you what this does, because you, you're, a lot of times you're going to do stuff, and you're going to say, hey, does that, is that right? Does that make it look better? So what I'm doing is I'm simply lowering the front of that base. And it needs to be pushed back a little bit now or the shadow needs to come forward a little bit. But that's putting it down on the ground. Before it was up here. Let me zoom in so you can see it. There we go. Uh, so just simply lowering the front or lowering the bottom of the base puts it down more on the floor. So we can do that on both sides, by the way. So that's, that's kind of an easy beginner way to do it, just warping it into place. Uh, so now when I click the commit button, that makes it that makes it permanent, by the way, but that's a permanent change. And now we can simply, um, actually just easier to move our shadow. Now the shadow's making it look a little bit lifted. So we don't want to go overboard with the shadow and maybe something like that. Because again, if it were on the ground, you might not see a shadow directly under it like that. So you might just see how I push it a little bit further back. Because if it's flat on the ground, you wouldn't see a shadow. 
because it's covering what the shadow would be. So in this case, maybe it looks better if the shadow's off to the side a little bit, in the back of it. So you'll start to develop these techniques simply by looking at something and always asking yourself, does that look real? Does that look real? And if it doesn't, whatever's bugging you about it, you gotta take care of that. All right, last but not least, I'm just gonna show you a quick technique for uh, main, making the shadow that would be laying down. So um, another sh another way to create a shadow is to to make the to take a copy of the object. So let's go in to uh, take the sh the base itself. Remember we're on that layer now, and we're going to make a copy of that layer. So we're just going to drag uh, again um, 50 ways. We can go to the layer menu. We can say new layer via copy, and that will make a copy. Command J. That's another way to make a copy on the keyboard. We can also just simply drag it down to the new layer icon, which is what I was instinctively about to do, and then I remember I had to explain it. All right, so that made a copy. Again, 50 ways to do the same thing. So now we have the base and vase. <laughs> so vase, copy, and vase. So maybe I want to make this, or here, let's move that up. So they're the same layer, it doesn't matter. I just we're moving it down for the sake of the name. So we'll keep that one base, and we'll change the name of this one to shadow. All right, and uh, that's base shadow um, lying down. <laughs> okay, give it a better name. Okay, so now we have this one. Great. How do I make this base lay down flat? Before we worry about the color, how do I stretch it? How do I do all those things to make it go all the way across the room like that, like it were really casting a shadow? So again, free transform, command T. Um, cause again, we talked about all the ways. Now, when we're free transform, that's making it bigger, making it smaller, holding down the shift key, stretching it, so forth and so on, but that's not moving it. It's not laying it down. So when we, we could warp it, that would be another way. But in this case, I just want to use free transform and show you, uh, you're going to use free transform a lot to kind of warp. No, I shouldn't say warp, um, maneuver things into position. So I'm going to right click on the free transform window and change it to distort because distort lets me do anything I want. Warp is, is, is what we were in. Perspective may sound like the right thing, especially for lowering that down, but it's not gonna give you exactly what you want. Distort lets you do anything you want. So once I hit distort, nothing happens, but now all the handles move independently. So I could take a handle, I can do like this. I can make, do, bend it over, I can take this handle and lay it down that way. I can do this. I can do anything I want because these handles now work independent of each other. So I can start to warp or to, to store it in position and get it laying down flat on the ground. Again, we're gonna do a lot of things to it to make it look better, but I'm just kind of getting it aligned up in the same direction as the shadows that are already there. All right, so now that we got it kind of in the same direction and we stretched it out nicely, now let's uh let's again we're just doing this quick let's go ahead and say we're done with that and of course <laughs> your shadows don't look like that they don't look like the actual object they're just in the shape of the object so how do we get this um this uh this shadow layer to look just black and, and less opaque uh so again lots of ways to do this we could go to the layer we're on um and we could apply a, a image command to it, like levels. We could paint it black. We could um, apply an adjustment layer. We, so all, again, lots of things you haven't learned yet, but lots of ways to do that. Let's stick with a, a basic one, just so you can learn more about layers. So let's say that I want to paint it black. I'm on this and I say, oh, you know what? He showed me that black paintbrush. That will work great. And yes, it will and it won't. Because if I start painting, this is what's gonna happen. Yep, it's painting black. Great. And that worked because there was a mask. If there wasn't a mask, and so here, let's get rid of the mask. Let me right click the mask and say, um, um, apply, apply mask, I was on the right there. Okay, so now there's no mask. If that mask weren't there and you just start painting, this is what would happen. You could paint outside the lines. So 
I want to paint within the lines, which is great. The mask let me do that, but the mask wouldn't let me do the next step anyway, so I got rid of it. So how would I paint just on the object itself, not on the rest of the transparent part of the layer? Well, one way you could do that is to simply, uh, I want to go into, I want to lock. There we go. I was looking at the wrong, wrong location. Notice there's a lock and there's lots of icons here. Well, one of the first ones is lock the transparency of that layer, meaning don't let you do anything outside of the layer pixels themselves. So if I just click the lock, now if I start painting on the wall, nothing happens. But as soon as I drag that paintbrush across, it does the same thing that the mask did. It will not let me paint anywhere outside the window, the walls, the door, except that because I locked the transparency. Once I'm done painting, I can unlock the transparency. So that shadow layer now is black. Great, what else makes it look real? It wouldn't be hard edged and it wouldn't be as opaque. So how do we make it look soft? How do we make the whole, we didn't, we can't paint it with a black brush to stay within the lines and have it look soft if they're hard lines. So how do we make it look blurry after the fact? This is what filters are for. So if I go to my filter menu, I can go to my filter menu and come down to um, blur. I can use Gaussian blur, which is a common filter for just making things blurry. When I use Gaussian blur, you get a preview. It's set to a very low number. As soon as I raise the number up, I start to see my object get blurry. So let's say I want to keep it, because if I go too far, then, it, then it's, it's, it'll work, but it's, it's, I want to keep some of that shape defined. So I'll come back a little bit, a little bit more, maybe that. Okay, so now we're, we're there and we just do the same thing we did last time. We lower the opacity because it's too opaque. Maybe something like that. Now, if I were to show this to you, if you just walked into the stream, you wouldn't immediately say that vase wasn't there. Lighting works because the vase is, oh, it's by the window, so it's lit. If it were behind the chair, the lighting wouldn't work because it'd be too bright if the chair is not as bright as the vase. It's the same window, the chair is in front of it. Why isn't the chair brighter? So these are the kinds of things that you need to do to um, yep, uh, look, look at the shadow on the vase. It's helping you get the ground shadow more believable. Yeah, at the end of the day, and I'm not saying this is perfect by any means because we're doing a quick rush job, but at the end of the day, it's about you tweaking it until you are satisfied that it looks believable or people you show it to. Now, in this case, I think the original shadow might be a little too dark. So now I can bring that down a little bit. There we go. And again, it's all tweaking. And that's what working with layers lets you do. Let you create a blank layer and add whatever you want to it. In this case, we brush the shadow under the vase. Let you duplicate a layer and do whatever you want to the duplicate. Lay it down, paint it black, blur it, lower the opacity. And maybe the opacity of that, you know, now I'm looking at it, it could be a little less. Something like that. So uh, you just spend your time tweaking it till you're happy. Okay, so now that look that we came from, that vase didn't look like it was supposed to be there at all because it didn't look like it was on the ground or on the floor. And we made it look more like it should, it was there. It made it look more believable. Okay, so now with that said, um, Let's close that. Let's get into another. So today we're going to do more on selections. Let's uh, save. The, we'll do a save. So since you didn't see this last time, I'll just hit save. Because it's got layers in it, it won't save it as a JPEG by default. It's going to say, hey, you probably want to keep these layers. So let's go ahead and make this a PSD. And Photoshop, save to the same folder. I don't care if it's the same name because the new one's going to have .psd on the end of it. Okay, so now we can close that one. We can close that one. I just hit Command W for close window like you normally would on any other application. Now we're going to do open. We're going to do something a little bit more fun. Let's go. I want the leopard. Good. I want the, this is all Adobe stock, by the way. These are not my pictures. And I want the owl. Okay, cool. So uh, same thing. I want to now show you a little bit more with selected mask because the owl has feathers, fur, feathers, feathers. So that it's a little softer edge. That vase was easy um, because it was a hard edge. R removing the background was simple on hard edge objects, on hair and fur and feathers, a little harder. 
So let's take this using the same method we used before, drag it over, bring it down. Great, oh, it's too big. Okay, uh, zoom out a little bit so I can see it. There we go. Command T for free transform. It's super big. All right, and now the other thing is if I were putting the aisle over here on this side, that works great, but I don't want it on that side because the, the leopards are on that side. So I move it over here and I'm just gonna do one thing. While I'm in free transform, I'm going to right click and flip horizontal. Just flip it over. There we go. And now we'll get a little smaller. All right, there we go. Um, now, so we, we, again, perspective, size, is it the right size? It's not the right angle necessarily, but the right size. Is that because it's too big? What's the distance between it and the leopard? Would it really be that big that if it wasn't further in front? All the things you start asking yourself. Um, but that's not what this is for. This is more mainly for cutting this out. So before, remember we did that select subject and it didn't really work that well on the guy's fingers? Well, we're gonna do a second part of that that would, that would have worked better. So select subject, which should, oh, and by the way, let's name our layer so we know what we're doing. Ow, okay. And uh, select subject, which again, should be easy because there's only the aisle there. Now, if I were to cut that out as it stands right now, that would be a hard edge selection because select subject by default is usually hard edge if it doesn't know that there are feathers there or fur or hair. It does a better job on portraits now, so it is, it is doing hair better. But for animals, it, it's you know never, not necessarily gonna do it right. So before we say okay, before we do anything, let's go to select one more time and choose selected mask. Selected mask is a workspace in Photoshop that helps you get your cutout better. So if I go to selected mask, this is what we would get normally. And by the way, um, uh, what you're viewing it on matters. So I'm viewing it on transparency, I think. I'm viewing it on onion skin, which is the transparency. Um, so onion skin lets me do this. It lets me bring back the background and see it really there and, and then do that kind of thing. Great. Okay, so the next thing that, um, and by the way, you could view it on black. You can see your cutout that way. You can view it on white, which uh, is irrelevant in this case. You could do it on the layers, which is another way I usually do it. That way I can see exactly what I'm going to get on the layers. And what I want to do is I want to um, refine the edge. So I want to refine the edge based on the object aware versus color aware. So I'm going to do object aware. I'm going to switch that mode. And I'm going to hit refine hair, even though it's not hair. And okay, there we go. And now, if I were to just simply take the brush, I'm, am I on the right brush? Yep, nope, I'm not on the right brush. If I were to take the refine brush, which is the second one down, and I make my brush a little smaller. If I out here, I know this is where the background used to be. But if I start in the background and paint down around the object, so I would have gone in between those fingers with the brush, it will start, in this case, I did too much. It will start to show you what that edge would look like if that edge weren't hard. So in this case, yeah, see, you start to see the, the feathers pop up there. So that's what refined edge is giving me. So just coming around it and brushing back in that softness or that hair or whatever it is will help you get a cleaner, better selection. Now it looks like it's bringing the background back, but it's just showing you where you're painting. And you, the smaller the brush, the better usually. Uh, you don't want a huge brush, even though, oh, a huge brush will let me do it quicker. No, it's gonna give you worse results. Trust me, I've been here. So that's the kind of stuff that, uh, again, like these hard edges here, that's the kind of stuff that will soften your edges as you paint around or between the things that should be hair or fur. Okay, next up, I'm not going to do the whole thing for the sake of time. Uh, cut down too far. Still too far.
Okay. I can spend 10 more minutes on that. I'm not going to. Um, the other thing you can do is you can adjust the uh, smart radius. And that will also, see how that's just automatically bringing it out? Smart radius is, is designed to find what should be hard and keep it hard, what should be soft and keep it soft. So it's, it's just kind of, don't go too far, but right about there is probably good. And it's just autumn, oh, too far. Nope. Hang on, I'm just checking one more thing. My smart radius is not giving me what I want. It's showing me what I want. It's not giving me what I want. Oh, okay. I'd still need to paint it. But anyway. Nope. Oh, all right. Anyway, maybe that will work depending on your object. Maybe it won't. Um, you can also, you, I usually don't play around with these, the feathering, the smoothness, and the contrast, but you can give those a shot. And like the feathering is going to soften that edge up quite a bit as well. So just that alone will help me. And then when you're done, the one thing you want to make sure is once you're happy with the edge, you want to make sure it's on a new layer with a layer mask because that'll always give you the ability to go back and keep working on it. So now I've got that owl on a new layer with a mask. And I can still go in and if it's too big, make it smaller. I can't move it out here because there's, I don't have the rest of the aisle. So I have to keep it in a corner because that's the way the photo was taken. But uh, just keep in mind, you don't want to, you know, make it unrealistically big because it's just like you can tell it's put together because it's just too big in front of the leopard and the leopard's not looking at the aisle. Trust me, if that, leopard, if that aisle were really right there, that leopard's eyes would be over there. And you can't move it in front because you don't have the rest of the aisle. All right, so those are the kinds of things you should be looking at when you're cutting things out. Um, all right. Yep, okay, good. I'm just checking the questions. And we got time for maybe one more. I just want to look, also look at my list. We did that, we did that, we did that. We did, oh, we did a lot of what I wanted to do. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> lighting. Remember I said the dead giveaways? The lighting of the aisle compared to the uh, leopard doesn't look right. It, it looks a little too bright. It looks a little too not the same color even. So even if you got the, the feathers and everything perfect in selected mask, another dead giveaway is why is the aisle so bright compared to the warmer leopard? So one of the things I want to show you is using the camera raw filter. There are lots of uh, adjustments, traditional adjustments in the adjustments menu. You could go to levels and curves and exposure and vibrance and hue and such, all of these. These have been in Photoshop for years and years and years. But honestly, I, I call these legacy adjustments because they're for the people that have used them for years and years and years and years and years. There's nothing wrong with them. It's just not the way I would necessarily teach a new user to get started. Because a new user, these are kind of intimidating. Like if I bring this up, you don't know what to do here. Like, like this is just, and it would take me a half hour to explain it, right, to, to get you comfortable with it. So why bother with this traditional way? And again, no, no shame on the people that use this and know it and use it professionally. Great, awesome. But if I were teaching someone new, which I am, I would say, well, why, why not try the easier way, which is the camera raw filter. Now, before I get started with the camera raw filter, I could just go up and choose it. Filter, uh, camera raw filter, and get going. But I want to make it non-destructive because I, I may want to change my mind. So before I run a filter, one of the first things you want to do is convert that fil convert that layer for smart filters. That basically makes it what's called a smart object. So it puts this little icon on the layer. And the best way I can explain a, um, a smart object is imagine you have a, uh, a Tupperware container or plastic container, not branded. And you put this water bottle in it and you put the lid on it and you start writing on it with a magic marker. Obviously you're writing on the container, not the water bottle. So 
think of it as a way of protecting your layer, even though you might, you might bend it, you might do all kinds of things to it, but the actual pixels of the layer itself aren't being affected. That's what a smart object is. And that's what convert for smart filters does. So now after I've done the convert for smart filters, if I go into camera raw filter, I can play all day long here and it will not mess up my, um, my original aisle. So now the only, the only drag is you can't really see it with the composited image. At least I don't know a way of doing that. It'd be nice if we could see the composite too, but we can't. So some of the things I might do here is I might drop the exposure a little bit. Again, start. I'm looking at the leopard over here, kind of starting to match that. I might also increase the temperature a little bit, just warm it up. Again, looking at the leopard and again, bring that exposure down just a bit. So now if I overdo it or don't do enough, no problem. Click OK. Look at it. Oh, that looks a lot better. Look at it and you notice what it did under the layer. It put the smart filter, the camera raw filter, and so everything you do, you did as a smart filter, you can turn off. See, that's our before. That's our after. Which one looks more believable? This one. And if it's, oh, it's too dark. No problem. Double click on the camera raw filter to take you right back into the camera raw window and say, oh, bump the exposure back up just a hair. Click OK. That's better. So you don't ever lose the ability to go back in the camera raw or whatever filter you're on and make changes. All right, with that said, I'm not gonna get cut off today. I'm gonna be on time, I'm out of time. So we would save this as a PSD. We would export it as a JPEG or whatever we wanna save it on. And you guys let me know in the chat if you want a part three of this. Do you wanna continue? Because I can always find you more stuff to learn. So let me know if you want a part three. And with that said, cheers everyone. All right. Bye, everybody. Take care.